All right. Um, yesterday, or Tuesday, we started chapter 16, so we'll just continue with chapter 16 today. Um, writing electronic forms and interpretation of contracts. All right, so when we left off on Tuesday, we were talking about the statute of frauds. All right, just to uh, to sort of re re uh, review what we had talked about. Um, oral contracts up there, number one, are they valid? Yes, always valid? No, uh, it all depends. A, uh, a oral contract, if it's uh, uh, not required to be in writing, will be just fine. But if it is required to be in writing, then an oral contract is not necessarily valid. We'll see that there's a lot of weird little twists and turns in the law. But uh, what would make a contract be required to be in writing? Well, we refer to that as a statute of frauds. Okay, now statute of frauds, um, well, the point I started trying to make last class was it's going to be a certain type of contract. Contract that uh, first off uh, is either because it's very important or secondly, because we believe there's going to be an issue with trying to prove the contents at some point in the future of what the contract was. All right, so I want to start with, uh, on my outline there, 2B, a contract for the sale of land. That is a contract that, under the law, we consider to be extraordinarily important, okay? I've talked about this uh, repeatedly through the semester. Our land has a very special place in the law. It's... Um, it uh, realistically uh, is as important as anything in the property side. Uh, real property holds a very special place in the in the law. Um, land is the is the uh, basis of all power and wealth. Okay, keep that in mind. So as a result, because of how important land is, if you want to get into a contract for the sale of land, if you want to convey land, it has to be done in writing. Okay, plain and simple. Statute of fraud says you want to convey an interest in land, it becomes a writing. Now, so if we don't have it in writing, I'll, gear, I'll, I'll agree with you. We'll negotiate on the sale of my property. I have a house, and I think it's worth $100,000. We start negotiating over it. You offer me eighty. dollars I say, no, absolutely not. We go back and forth, back and forth. And finally, we agree with on a handshake, ninety-five. dollars Okay. There's no contract. It has to be in writing. No handshake, no oral agreement. Because it's land, it has to be in writing. There's no contract until it's reduced to, well, a piece of paper. You know, we'll, we'll talk about what a writing is a little bit uh, as we move further, a little bit into the future here. Um, but a contract for the sale of land. How about for the mineral rights on a piece of property? Does that have to be in writing? Yeah. It's a conveyance of an interest in land. When we get to the chapter on, on land, real estate, um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about, and this is the way that it was described to me in law school, the ownership of land can be best understood as a bundle of sticks. Okay, you walk around your property and just keep picking up bundle, you know, stick after stick after stick that's laying on the ground. At the end of the day, you have a bundle of sticks. That's what real estate ownership really is, because it's not just, okay, I own this land. Well, what is it that you own? Later on, we'll learn about different levels of ownership of land, okay? I can own the, the right to live on the land but not the right to have it in the future. I can have a present interest in land. I can own the future of the land, but not the present of the land. I can own the mineral rights, but nothing else. Or if I have what's called fee simple absolute, I have the whole bundle. I own everything there is to own, okay? Any one of those sticks that you want to sell, it has to be in writing, okay? Yeah, if you want to sell the whole bundle of sticks and give somebody fee simple absolute, that has to be in writing. But if I want to give you the rights to live on the property for the rest of your life, is that an interest in land? 
Yes, it is. It's one of the sticks. Current possession is one of the sticks in the bundle, but it's not the entire bundle. Still has to be in writing. Okay, so any piece of that ownership has to be in writing. Now, that being said, what about a lease? You want to rent uh, an apartment. You want to rent a house. Does that have to be in writing? Not necessarily. Okay. For whatever reason, we don't consider a lease as having to be in writing. Now, change the question. Is it a good idea for it to be in writing? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If you have the ability to put something in writing, it's always a good idea. Um, certain types of leases, you should, uh, and I'm not really sure what the rule is. I think each state's a little bit further different. Um, I think in Pennsylvania, if you have a lease for five years um, or, or more, it has to be in writing and it has to be recorded at the courthouse because it's such a substantial interest that has to be reduced to writing. But if I want to rent an apartment, it doesn't have to be in writing. Good idea to be in writing. It doesn't have to be. All right, so let's go and look at the other types of things that are out here that have to be in writing according to the statute of frauds. 2A. A contract that cannot be performed in one year. I think we talked about this last class. I think I talked about building a skyscraper in Greenville. Am I going to be able to build a 60-story skyscraper in downtown Greenville in a year? Probably not. It's going to take more than a year to build you know, some such, such colossus. Okay, So that's a contract that cannot be performed in one year. Why does that have to be in writing? Well, that's more of a credibility type issue you know in the few, in a year from now two years from now three years from now whenever this contract is finally completed what were its terms we're we going to remember what we talked about three years ago probably not as clearly as we think we're going to should it be in writing so that we know what the contract actually was yeah the contra the uh, statute of fraud says yeah that has to be in writing all right uh, to c Contract to answer for the debt of another. Okay. Uh, let's say that I don't have good credit and I want to buy a car. I go to the car dealer, pick out a car. They go and try to arrange financing and they come back and say, no, no bank will lend to you because your credit is so bad. We need to have somebody else that's going to guarantee this debt for you. Oh, no, my dad said he'd take care of that for me. My dad said that he would you know, he would be responsible for the debt, you know, so go ahead, lend me the money. And if I don't pay it, my dad will pay it. Oh, okay. Think that should be in writing? Yeah, absolutely. People going to lie about the fact that somebody else is going to be responsible for their debt? Yeah. Okay. So if anybody is talking about being responsible for the debt of another person, that has to be in writing. And so go back to my my situation. No bank will lend you the money if you want to buy the car. You have to have somebody else that's going to co-sign on here. My dad said he'll do it. Bring him down. Have him sign the paperwork. We'll give you the car. Okay. So my dad coming down and co-signing on my loan means that he is agreeing to be responsible for my debt if I don't pay it. That's what a co-signer is or a guarantor under a debt. Okay. Then if so long as he signs, it's in writing. If I don't make the payments and the uh, bank goes and tries to collect against my father, my father can't defend by saying, that was a lie. I never said I, oh, yeah, you signed, buddy. You will, you will be responsible. All right. Uh, D, a contract by an executor to pay the claims from his personal accounts. Okay. Um, we will have a chapter on decedents estates i think it's the very last chapter next semester okay so decedents estates you have to think about how do we handle property rights when somebody dies see one of the things that happens is that whatever you own isaac you own a car you own it outright you don't owe anybody any money on it and who in the world is allowed to deal with that car? Who's allowed to sell it? Who's allowed to get it repaired? Who's allowed to drive it? You and only you. It's that way with every piece of property. Whatever you own 
is yours and you are the only person on the planet that's allowed to deal with it. You die, now there's nobody on the planet capable of dealing with it. That's why we have a whole division of the law that rises up to deal with the decedent's property, the decedent's estate. We call it probate law. And what happens is an executor or somebody has to be appointed by the system, we're going to say by the court, to be your executor, to be your personal representative, to take your place on earth when it comes to dealing with your property and your debts and your taxes and all the things that you could have done and should have done while you are alive, this court-appointed personal representative does that for you now. Now, the thing about being an executor is that you don't have to put your own money into this, okay? So if uh, my father dies and I I'm the executor of his estate, my job is to identify all of his assets, theoretically turn all of his assets into cash, find out all of the debts, who does he owe money to? My responsibility is to pay off all of his debts from the assets that I've, that I've found. Once I've done that, pay whatever taxes are left and then whatever is left, distribute to whoever the, is going to inherit his heirs, okay? What happens if we get to a point where the assets are not adequate to pay the bills? Is it possible to die owing more money than you have? Sure it is. We refer to that as an insolvent estate, and we have a specific way of handling that under the law. Well, one of the things that could happen is me as the executor, I could say to that creditor, you know what, I really want to protect my father's uh, 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 reputation, so I'll pay this debt out of my pocket. I have no legal responsibility to pay the debts of the decedent from my own personal assets, but I can do that if I want, right? I can do anything I want. So I tell this particular creditor, hey, I'll pay that so it's not going to be a problem for you. And then a couple of months later, they say, hey, where's that money you promised me? And I go, I'm not paying you anything. And they sue me based on my promise that I was going to pay this debt for my father that I'm not legally responsible for, but he said he'd pay it. Well, you think maybe that there's an opportunity that a creditor would lie about that? Absolutely. So if a, if a executor says he's going to pay an expense uh, that belongs to an estate from his own personal assets, get it in writing. Once again, this is a credibility issue. Just like, you know, a creditor saying, oh yeah, well, Billy said that you would pay his debts for him. Where did I write, you know, where did I sign that? Same thing with a creditor here of a decedent. Well, yeah, the decedent said, no, you said you'd pay it out of your assets. When did I say that? Do you have it in writing? So it's a credibility issue. It has to be in writing. Promises and consideration of marriage. Back to the book for this one. A promise to pay a sum of money or to give property to another in consideration of marriage must be in writing under the statute of frauds. Anybody know what a dowry is? See, we live in a society that has grown up out of other the ashes of other societies that we used to be. Um, we used to be an agrarian society. All we would do, we had farming, right? There wasn't really much in the way of you know, industry you go back before the industrial revolution. You know, how did people live? Well, you had a farm of some sort. You grew something, and perhaps you bartered with other farmers. I grew, I grew wheat, and you have cows. I'll give you bread if you give me meat. You know, that's how we used to do this. Now, think about a society that is based on farming. Okay, so you're the, uh, you're the head of the household. I'm going to do this from a purely male-oriented point of view because we're back in the 1800s now. Sorry, girls. But, you know, the male, the man, he gets married, has a wife, and he has a bunch of kids. 
Now, I'm going to ask you very specifically, would you rather have sons or daughters? Because they're going to work the farm and be more useful to you, aren't they? Now, the, the women folk, of course, are going to be able to keep the house, do some of the farm work, but not the heavy, heavy lifting. And they're going to be some help, but the sons are a lot more useful on the farm. I don't want to put it quite this way, but if you look at a society like that, daughters are kind of a liability. They're not helping you farm, and they're eating the food. So I want to get rid of the daughters. How do I get rid of the daughters? No, I don't kill them. I marry them off. Okay, so all the surrounding farms, all those sons that are working those farms, they need wives. I'll sell off. I'm not selling off my daughters. It's the exact opposite. I'm going to bribe the son of the farmer down the road to take my daughter off my hands. Well, if you marry my daughter, I will give you X number of dollars or three cows and a pig or, you know, whatever. That's what's called a dowry. It's the payment that used to be made in our agrarian society for a family to shuffle off their daughters into marriage. Okay? It makes sense in, in the terms of where we were in history, right? And so that was a dowry. Well, it has to be in writing. That's all I'm going to say. It has to be in writing. Now, in today's world, does this have any applicability? Um, well, it does have some applicability in today's world. Um, Do you ever hear of, uh, of, of the term prenuptial agreement? Okay, so you, you'll hear about this generally when you're you're listening to stories about the rich and famous. Okay, so uh, I'm a multi-billionaire single playboy, and I decide I'm going to get married. I found the woman of my dreams, and my friends are telling me, you know, she's only marrying you for your money. No, 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 it's true. Love. You only marry you for your money. Get a prenuptial agreement. Well, a prenuptial agreement is an agreement that okay. If we get married, what happens if we get divorced? What happens if I die? Do you inherit? See, I, we can, under the law, that's dealt with. If we don't have a prenuptial agreement and we end up getting into a divorce, well, very likely what's going to happen is I'm going to lose a bunch of my assets because the courts will look at the accumulation of wealth during the time of the marriage and say, half of that belongs to the wife. Half of that is yours, but half of that is it was made possible because of the fact you were married. So as a result, you're going to get divorced. You're going to lose this chunk of your assets. You see it all the time. And, you know, this celebrity got divorced and it cost him $2 billion, you know, whatever. Okay. Well, if you have a prenuptial agreement at the beginning before you get married, and you could have in there, in the event that we get divorced, you will only get X number of dollars or you know, some sort of a support, an annuity or, you know, or a lump sum of money. You can set all that out in advance. Okay. Um, if I die, do you get my stuff? You know, let's say this is a second marriage and I've got three kids from the first marriage and I'm 60 years old and getting married for the second time. Under the law, as my wife, you're entitled to half of my estate when I die. Okay? Do I want to give you, the second wife, who came along later in my life, half of my estate? Or do I want to protect that for my existing children that I've been raising for 40 years? Okay? So these are the types of things that would go into a prenuptial agreement. Guess what? Has to be in writing. Okay, so that's today's uh, application of this particular rule. Okay. Sale of goods. And I have UCC next to that. There is a portion of the Uniform Commercial Code which deals with whether a contract has to be in writing for the sale of goods. As is everything UCC, we'll wait until we get to the chapters on the UCC to talk about it. But understand there is a very specific UCC 
statute of frauds also. Promissory estoppel and enhanced promissory estoppel. I hate promissory estoppel. <laughs> the nature of the uh, statute of frauds may be circumstance circumvented when the party seeking to get around the statute of frauds is able to prove an enhanced promissory estoppel. One element of routine promissory estoppel requires that the promisee rely on a promise in some definite and substantive matter, manner. An enhanced level of re uh, reasonable reliance is necessary in order to have enhanced promissory estoppel, along with proof of unconscionable injury or unjust enrichment. All right, here's an example. Basically, what we're doing is we're talking about equity again. Okay, so uh, promissory estoppel is, well, wait a minute. We should this should be considered to be a contract in equity because you made me believe that we had a contract and I relied on your promise and I was harmed because of my reliance on your promise. Therefore, I should probably recover even though there was no real contract. Okay. Example, an Indiana bakery classic cheesecakes was able to in, in interest several hotels and casinos in Vegas in buying its products. In July 2004, the principal sought a loan from a local branch officer, J.P. Morgan, in order to establish a distribution center in Vegas. In September, the local bank officer, Dowling, told Classic that the loan was a go. When credit quality issues surfaced, Dowling continued to make assurances that the loan would be approved. On October 12th, however, she told Classic that the loan was denied. Classic claimed that the, the bank's breach of its oral promise to make the loan and Classic's detrimental reliance on the promise caused it to lose more than a million dollars. The Indiana Statute of, Fra of Frauds requires agreements to lending money to be in writing. Classic contended the oral agreement in this case must be enforced on the basis of promissory estoppel and the company's unconscionable uh, injury. Judge Posner of the Seventh Circuit upheld the dismissal of the claim, saying that it did not raise to the level of um, enhanced promissory estoppel. Okay. So once again, when you're in equity, you may get what you want. You may not get what you want. I will give you a quote. Nancy McLeod, a woman that I went to law school with. I don't know if she's still working as a lawyer or not, but she graduated. She went to work as an attorney for writing. Um, but when we were in law school together and we started, we were going through these things and every time equity would come up uh, and we would find out that if you're making an argument in equity, you're basically flipping a coin. If the judge is in a good mood, he may give you your request. If he's in a bad mood, he won't give you a request. There's no way of knowing if you're going to win in equity or not. So I'll give you a quote from Manson McLeod, equity sucks. She always wanted to have a absolute I win or I lose situation in equity. There's no way of knowing. It really depends on the mood of the judge as to whether he's going to flex his, his equity muscles or not. So Nancy would say equity sucks. Understand, you go into equity, you have no idea what's going on. Nothing. All right. I always like to bring Nancy into my teaching. Uh, note or memorandum. All right. Statute of frauds requires a writing to evidence these contracts, those contracts that come within its scope. The writing may be a note or memorandum as distinguished from a contract. The statutory requirement, of course, is satisfied if there's a complete written agreement signed by both parties. Who has to sign the document? Do both parties have to sign? Now, I'm not saying we don't have a contract. I'm saying we don't have a written contract, okay? So let's say that we have an oral contract. I, all right, I'll, I'll tell you that under the statute of frauds, under the UCC, any sale of goods over a certain dollar value, and it depends on whether you're in the original UCC or the, in the uh, revised UCC. I think the revised UCC is $3,000. $3, so let's use that. If it's a sale of goods for over $3,000, it's required to be in writing, okay? You and I go to lunch, and I'm trying to sell you my widgets, and we uh, have that three-martini lunch, 
And then during the uh, lunch, we talk about the fact that you want to buy $10,000 worth of widgets from me. And at the end of the lunch, we have on a handshake agree, yes, I'll sell you a thousand widgets at $10 a piece. You want to buy a thousand widgets and you're willing to pay $10 a piece. That's a $10,000 deal. We shook on it. Do we have a contract? Yes, we have a contract. Now, whether it's going to be enforceable or not is going to depend on the statute of, of frauds, right? Because statute of frauds is going to say that in order to enforce it, it has to be in writing. Who has to sign? Do both parties have to sign the writing for it to be valid or enforceable? The answer is no, it doesn't. There's a whole lot of ways of getting around the writing, but one of them is, okay, so we have this lunch. Abraham, it's you and me, okay? You're the buyer, I'm the seller. We have that lunch, we shake hands at the end, and you think to yourself, you know, that, that come on check may not be, deep, may not be uh, I, can't, I don't know if I can trust it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put together a memo. So you put together, a, uh, a quick little memo. Um, and dear Gamalchek, it was great to have lunch with you today. Uh, just as a reminder, during lunch we agreed that uh, you would you would sell me a thousand uh, widgets and that I would pay ten dollars a piece for them for a total of ten thousand dollars. And then you sign your name and you send it to me. Is that a writing? The writing. Is it a contract? I didn't sign it, did I? So it's not a contract, it's a memorandum. Now, let's say that we move a little bit forward in time here and I'm good to my word. I say, oh, okay, I'll, uh, I remember I'm supposed to send Abraham a thousand widgets. So I put the order in, a thousand widgets are made and I ship them off to his business. And then he says, I don't know why you sent me these widgets. We don't have a contract. I'm refusing to pay. Okay. Can I enforce the contract against Abraham? The answer here is yes. Because we have a writing that's going to, going to uh, uh, comply with the statute of frauds. Because it only has to be signed by the person or party to whom we want to enforce it against. I didn't sign it, but did I violate the agreement? No, I produced the uh, the widgets and I sent them. So you don't need a writing to get me to give you the widgets. I've already done that. I need a writing to get him to pay it. Do I have a writing that says that he wanted those widgets and was willing to pay? I do. Okay. So it only has to be signed by one of the parties and it has to be the one to whom you want to enforce it against. Let's say that we have the exact same situation. We have that lunch. Uh, Abraham goes back to his uh, office and he puts together the exact same memorandum and sends it off to me and I don't produce the widgets. And then he sues me. I'm going to say, your honor, where's the writing? And he's gonna produce the memo. And I'm gonna say, your honor, where did I sign this? I didn't. Now, when we get to the UCC, you'll see that there's more troubles with what we're doing here. But under this particular grouping of, you know, of facts under the common law, it can be signed by it, it can be signed by one party, but it has to be the party that you want to use it to enforce against. Okay, what does the book actually say? The note or memorandum must be signed by the party sought to be bound by the contract. Um, Previous scenario involving Mark Wahlberg and Steven Spielberg. Suppose the parties agreed to do the film according to the same terms, but agreed to begin shooting the film a year from next April. And Mark wrote on the essential terms on a napkin, dated it, and had Steven sign it to make sure I got it right. Mark then placed the napkin in his wallet for his records because the contract could not be performed within one year after the date of agreement. A writing would be required. If Stephen thereafter decided not to pursue the film, Mark would enforce the contract because of the napkin note had been signed by the party bound to be charged. Okay. What about electronic signatures? Uh, 
Um, let's go a little bit further than the book does. Um, let's talk about the writing. Let's talk about the writing. We live in a world now where paper is becoming less and less important, right? We're doing more and more things electronically. So um, the last few real estate deals that I've been involved in, um, I would get an email from the realtor. Okay, so in a, in a normal real estate transaction, the realtor puts the contract together and then the, the, the buyer is making the offer to make to buy the property. So what will happen is the realtor will make the contract on behalf of the buyer. The buyer will sign it and send it over to the seller for final approval. And then the seller will sign it and we'll have that contract that we need. It's in writing it's for land, so it has to be in writing, okay? But the last few that I've been involved in, the realtor created the contract and then emailed it to me. If I'm, the, if I'm the buyer, then I'm going to have to sign this contract, but I have to sign it electronically. So what they've given me uh, the opportunity to do, if you've ever seen a real estate contract, you have to initial in a bunch of different places. You have to initial every page, and then you have to sign the last page. Okay, So I had to electronically initial all the various parts. I had to initial each page and I had to sign it all electronically. Now the form that the realtors were using basically gave me the opportunity to click, just click a button and it would put my initials in there. Because at the beginning I would say who I am so it would know what my initials are and it would know what my signature is. So then I just go click and my initials would appear, click, my initials would appear, click, my initials would appear all the way down through, click, and then my signature would appear. That's all being done electronically. Valid. Then it goes to the bot to the seller. Same exact thing happens. Click, 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 click. And we have all the things in, filled in on the form, but nobody ever put pen to paper. Matter of fact, there is no paper. Is this in writing? Yeah, seller everything okay yeah because this is one of those areas where the law is trying to keep up with technology okay so one of the things that we have out there is we have the the, the uh, under electronic signature we have the uniform electronic transactions act ueta um, electronic signatures have parity with on paper signatures under the u the uniform electronic transactions act the act treats e-signatures and e-records as if they were handwritten. The parties themselves determine how they will determine each other's identity, such as by credit card or password or PIN or other secure means. Certain documents and records are exempt under the act, such as uh, wills, trusts, and commercial law uh, transactions. Um, so we, and by the way, that's a federal law. The UETA is a federal law. So the Uniform Commercial Code and all of these common law things that we're talking about, this is all under state law. So can a state say, no, it physically has to be in writing and you have to physically put pen to paper? <laughs> no, because the federal law now says that electronic transactions are the same and electronic signatures are the same as paper and pen, okay? So federal law is supreme, right? Under the supremacy clause, so that's going to override any state law that says it has to be in writing. So when I say that the statute of frauds requires something to be in writing, that's actually what it says. But the federal law now says, well, we consider electronic information to be writing. Okay. Now, the rule on this it doesn't go into it in depth here, but the rule on this is as long as it can be stored electronically in a format that can be retrieved, and produced physically at a moment's notice, then that's going to be considered okay. So if I've got this form that was created by the realtor and I've clicked my initials and my signature on it, the other party has clicked their initials and their signature on it. And if we wanted it printed, it could be printed in a, at, in a moment's notice, that qualifies. That's a writing, okay? 
Um, you'll also find, you know, one of the biggest transactor out there right now, strange word, uh, is Amazon, right? So under the uh, UCC, all transactions for sale of goods over a certain dollar value are required to be in writing. Are transactions with Amazon ever in writing? Well, they're not in paper, are they? Are they're all electronic? So if, you know, and anybody here that hasn't bought something from Amazon? Okay, so you've all seen the order screen. You know, you go through, you pick your item, you put it in your cart, and you click on the stupid cart, and it brings up and says, here's what's in your cart. Here's what it will cost you. Here's how we want you to pay for it. Here's your credit card you have on file. Here's where you say you want it to be delivered. By clicking here, you've agreed to this order. Click, guess what? That was your signature. The fact that you were told by clicking here, you make the contract valid, that was your electronic signature. Why? Because you agreed to it and they were willing to accept that it was you because of the fact that you had your password to get into the account, right? That's electronic signatures. All right, so now the next thing is peril evidence. The peril evidence rule. Now the peril evidence rule is the court saying, you know what? We have a writing here in front of us, don't we? It appears that within the four corners of this document, we have an agreement. We have what the contract is. We have what you guys agreed to. We have your signatures. Both, you know, both parties signed. Looks like a contract to us. What's the question that's brought before us today? One of the parties wants to say, that's not what we agreed to. Now, have we talked about this before? Talked about this once before when we were talking about the uh, offer and acceptance and we were talking about the fact that we had a transcription problem in the way the contract was put on paper, okay? And that's really where we are here today. We have a contract that really on its face is a contract and enforceable. And now what's happening is one of the parties is coming forward and saying, that's not the contract. Court wants to say, look, there's the four corners. Show us where it says that something else should be in this contract. There's nothing in there other than if we would have done a incorporation by reference, which would be another document. But we have it, everything down on paper. Why do we why should we think that it means anything else? Okay. Well, apparel evidence is what we're talking about. Uh, when con when the contract is evidenced by a writing. May the contract terms be changed by the testimony of witnesses. The general rule is that the peril or extrinsic evidence will not be allowed into evidence to add to, modify, or contradict the terms of a written contract that is fully integrated or complete on its face. Evidence of an, uh, of an alleged earlier or oral or written agreement within the scope of the fully integrated written contract or evidence of an alleged uh, co contemporaneous oral uh, agreement within the scope of the fully integrated written contract is inadmissible as peril evidence. Peril evidence is admissible, however, to show fraud, duress, or mistake under certain other circumstances described as follows. Okay, so the general rule is if you've got what looks to be a full contract, the court really does not want to hear anything else. However, if based on the, you know, this is based on the theory that either there never was an oral agreement or if there was, the parties abandoned it when they reached the stage in negotiations to execute the written agreement. Social objective of the parallel evidence rule was to give stability to contracts and prevent the assertion of terms that did not exist or do not uh, did not survive the bargaining of the parties. When does the parallel evidence rule not apply? Ambiguity. If you have more than one reasonable interpretation of what the language is, if the written contract is ambiguous, may have two or more different meanings, parallel evidence may generally be admitted to clarify the meaning. Fraud, duress, or mistake. A contract apparently complete on its face may have omitted a provision that should have been included. 
parallel evidence may be admitted to show that a provision was omitted as a result of fraud, duress, or mistake. Okay, so when we talked before about a mistake in transcription, that's what we're talking about here. Obviously, if there was fraud or duress, that's not going to be on the paper, is it? Well, by the way, you know, I, I signed this under duress because I had a gun to my head. No, they're going to shoot you if you do that, right? So duress is not something that can be proved on the paper. So yeah, the courts will let you do that outside the paper. Modification. Parallel evidence rule prohibits only the contradiction of a complete written contract. It does not prohibit proof that the contract was thereafter modified or terminated. So, parallel evidence. General rule, not allowed. Fraud, duress, mistake, maybe, probably. Cons rules of construction. All right, so rules of construction. I have A through F here. Do we tend to use the ordinary meaning of words? Do we use the technical meaning of words? Uh, interpretation of contract using the whole contract, dealing with ambiguity, determining the meaning using a method of writing, ambiguity judged against the drawer of the contract. Okay. So, rules of construction. Intention of the parties. When people get into an agreement, it's presumed they intend for the agreement to have effect. The court will strive to determine the intent of the parties and make sure to give an effect to it. Therefore, a contract, therefore, is to be enforced according to its terms. A court cannot remake or rewrite the contract of the parties under the pretense of interpreting it. Okay, so remember when we talked about um, uh, covenants not to compete last class? And uh, the book said that some jurisdictions will rewrite the clause in order to make it effective. I don't think that's really a very common thing because the general rule is that, con that, uh, that the courts do not want to rewrite your contract. Okay? They want to give it some, it some effect. They want it to, to mean something, but they tend to not rewrite contracts. Okay? So what about the words, meaning of the words? Ordinary words are to be interpreted according to their ordinary meanings. For example, when a contract requires the gasoline dealer to pay for supply, uh, his supply, uh, for gallons, applied, the term gallons is unambiguous and does not require that an, an adjustment of the gallon be, be made for temperature. Um, when the contract calls for a business person to pay a builder for building costs, Cost is unambiguous, meaning actual costs, not a lesser amount. Uh, if there's common meaning to a term, that meaning will be followed. <clears throat> Although the dictionary may contain an additional meaning. If technical ter trade terms are used, they should be uh, interpreted according to their technical meaning. Okay, so common words should be interpreted in a common way. Now, I'm under the impression from what I read there that when a uh, gas station gets a delivery of gas, that there may be a problem with how many gallons you get based on the temperature of the gasoline, right? So everything expands and contracts when hot or cold, right? So if you have, uh, you know, the whole, the whole idea behind a, uh, a thermometer is that the, the liquid that's inside the tube expands when it's warmer, so it goes up the scale and contracts when it's colder, so it goes down the scale. So if you are receiving gasoline and if it was 80 degrees, you would have 5,200 gallons. And if it was 20 degrees, you'd have 5,000 gallons. Is that a problem? So I guess if your contract just says gallons, the court is going to say, well, what did the meter say when it was pumped out of the tank? Well, but that's not, no, it's not what it says. Contract says gallons. So common meaning should be interpreted. If that's an actual issue in your industry, then what you should do is you should say gallons as, uh, as measured at X degrees. And then that would give you a reason to interpret it differently. Okay. Technical words, obviously, if you are an engineer or if you are an architect or something like that, you may have a every 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 profession has its own language, don't they? 
we all have our ways of talking. You know, as a lawyer, there's a lot of stuff that I use routinely that if I were to say to you, you would say, I have no idea what you're talking about unless you spoke Latin. There's a lot of crap that I have is actually based in Latin. I went to law school with one guy who I referred to as Mr. Latin. Love of the fact that most of the stuff was completely unintelligible unless you spoke Latin. And he loved to use all of that stuff. I particularly would rather use the English translation. And I only use the Latin stuff for when it's absolutely necessary because it's expected in the law that I'm practicing at the time. Um, but, all right, so ordinary meaning or technical meaning, depending on what you are, what you're doing. Um, interpretation of a clause in the contract by looking at the contract as a whole. Okay, so you may have a little bit of an ambiguity if you took one paragraph out, just took it completely out of context. It's a 10 page contract and you take one paragraph out and you wanna argue about what it means. And it may look like it's pretty ambiguous because you don't know, you, you don't understand one of the terms or you don't really, you know, maybe there's a couple of different ways that you can really interpret that. The court is not going to look at the one paragraph. The court will look at the entire contract and they'll use where it is and all of the contextual clues inside of the contract as far as what it actually means. Now, there's lots of contracts that I get involved in that the first page of the contract is definitions because we know we're going to use certain words over and over and over, and we know how we want them to be interpreted. So maybe the first page is nothing more that when I say this, I mean this, when I say this, I mean this, when I say this, and a whole page of definitions and what they mean in the contract. And then later on, when you get to that paragraph that you think is unclear, well, if you go back to the definitions page and it gives you the definition as to how the word is used in that paragraph, yeah. So you have to interpret the contract as a whole, not just looking at bits and pieces of it. All right, daily, dealing with ambiguity. One term in a contract may conflict with another term, or one term may have two different meanings. It is then necessary for the court to determine whether there is a contract, and if so, what does the contract actually mean? Um, a contract term or provision that is ambiguous, if it is capable of one or more reasonable interpretations because of the uncertain meaning of terms or mixing of terms. A finding of ambiguity is justified only if the language of the contract reasonably supports competing interpretations. All right, so let's look at the nature of the writing. When a contract is partly a printed form and partly typewritten, and partly handwritten. Okay, so you're going to go into, let's say a car deal. You want to buy a car. Is there a standard form that they use for the purchase, the contract to purchase that car? Sure there, there is. There's a, there's a standard form, it's already pre-printed, and it, because there's a lot of what we in the legal profession refer to as boilerplate language. There's stuff that's gonna be in every single contract. And they can pre-print that so they don't have to have it done up and typed up for every single contract. So a portion of the form has been pre-printed by a printing company at the request of the, of the car dealership. Okay? But what's going to happen is there's going to be blanks in the form. Now, in today's world where we have the, use, you know, the extended use of word processors and whatnot, this may not be as big of an issue. But you may still run into this where you have somebody using a pre-printed form, okay, with blanks. Okay, so now you say, I want to buy that Chevy Impala, um, VIN number such and such and such and such, and I, I'm willing to pay $10,000 for it. Okay, so salesman gets it out, puts it in his typewriter, and so he's got all the pre-printed stuff on the form, but he's got the blank at the top that says description of car. So he puts Chevy Impala, VIN number such and such. Then there's a blank that says um, sold for the price of $10,000. He has to type in the one zero comma zero zero zero. And then there may be more things I want to, you know, I want some detailing done. I want, uh, I want uh, mud flaps or I want uh, uh, floor mats, you know, whatever. It could be 
something else typed in somewhere else in the form where there's another blank. And then there's a spot for me to sign. So I sign it. What's anybody buy ever buy a car at a dealer? Does a salesman say, great, sold, and sign it and give you the car? What happens next? Salesman goes, well, I don't know if I can sell it to you for that price. I'll go take it to my manager and see if he'll accept your $10,000 bid. And they'll go in the back room and they'll pretend to talk for a while to have a little bit of coffee. And the sales manager will say, I think you can get some more out of him. Tell him I rejected the deal and I won't take less than 12. And the salesman comes back and goes, Nope, says 10,000 is not enough. He needs 12. I'm not paying 12. Well, give me something to, to, to tell him. I'll pay 10,500. Okay, so on the contract, you've got big page. You got all this stuff that was already pre printed. And now we've got this box here where they typed in $10,000 originally. So now he rejected my $10,000. Uh, um, offer said he'll take 12. I don't want to pay 12. I tell him I'll pay 10,500. So the, the uh, salesman crosses this out and then using a pen, he writes $10,500. Takes it back to the sales manager. They goof around back there pretending that there's, you know, actually some negotiation going on. And he comes, he tells the salesman, go back and tell him. I'll take 11.5. So he comes back and goes, ah, oh, sorry. He says, no, 10.5 is not enough. He needs 11.5. And I go, listen, I'm willing to go to 11, not a penny more. So the salesman crosses out the 10,500 and he writes in $11,000, takes it back to the sales manager. He goes, that's where I wanted him to be. And he signs the contract. Okay. Do we have ambiguous terms on this contract? I'm going to say yes. Okay, there's way too many numbers on here, but this is how it happens in the real world. Okay, so now when we want to interpret this document, so let's say we end up in court, and I say I'm only willing to pay the ten thousand that we actually agreed to the ten thousand, then am I going to win or am I going to lose? Well, it does say 10,000 here, but it's scratched out. Also, it says 10,5, and that's scratched out. And also, it says 11,000. So the rules of interpretation are going to be that we're going to use, in order of importance, handwritten is more important than typewritten, which is more important than pre-printed. Because if you think about how this would work in the real world, we didn't even start negotiating before this stuff was printed, right? This is pre-printed days, weeks, months, years before I came in into the dealership. This was typewritten into the form at the initial beginning of the negotiation process. And then it was crossed out and it was handwritten at a later time. So if you were a judge looking to see what do you think the actual agreement was, is it going to be the pre-printed? No, there was no negotiation there at all. Was it the typewritten? Well, no, we have changes to that. So if you're the judge, you're saying, I want the last thing that was on here is probably what they agreed to. Well, that appears to be the last thing that was put on this document. Now, these other things where they're crossed out, what also should happen is they should be initial to acknowledge that I saw that those changes were made. But otherwise, you know, we could have the dealer, after I signed the contract, just go through and cross things out and change the price to whatever he wants, right? Because we all trust car dealers, right? So those are rules of interpretation. Handwritten is more important than typewritten, which is more important than preprinted. Always remember that. Also, what if you have a document that says, it's a check. So it's check 
you put in the number, numeric, you know, output, uh, um, called uh, Arabic numbers, and then you write it out in Word. And um, and zero zero one hundred dollars. Okay, you get a check like that. What is that check for? When we get to the chapter in the Lookable Instrument, first class of next semester, we talk about this. Rules of interpretation. What is that document value? The writing is more important than the number. Okay, and that's another rule of interpretation. Can that happen in a contract? But the rules of interpretation seem to say that you put more thought into this than you did in that. So this is probably what this contract is for. Once again, that's just a rule of interpretation. Um, all right, and one more thing in here. Um, if we have an ambiguity, and these rules of interpretation are not going to help us, the next rule is that ambiguity will always be judged against the party who drew up the writing. So if I actually drew up the writing, then, and there's an ambiguity in it, and it could be interpreted in one way that's favorable to me, and it could be interpreted in a way that's favorable to the other party. If I drew up the writing, I lose. Because the courts will say, you had full control of the writing, and you wrote it ambiguously. We're not going to reward you for being wrong. Okay? So, in the event that there's an ambiguity that can't be can't, can't be solved within uh, the other rules of interpretation, it will just be judged against the maker of the document. I think that's relatively fair. I don't have any issues with that. Mm, anything else important in here? Customs and usage of trade or commercial activity to which the contract relates may be used to interpret the, con the terms of the contract. For example, when the contract for construction of a building calls for turnkey construction, industry usage uh, is, is advisable to show what the, what the uh, term means. <clears throat> so if you're in the, in the construction business and somebody tells you that the contract is a, a turnkey contract, that means when you get the thing that you're, that's being built, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do in order to use the the, uh, the building is to turn the key in the door and walk in. Everything else is done. Okay. If there's anything in that in that construction that is not proper, is not complete, then the builder has to come back and fix it because it's not turnkey. If you have to, hey, there's a there's a a spot on the wall there that you didn't paint. I shouldn't have to do that turnkey construction. I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to you know, patch up your paint job. You should come back and fix that. Should have been done right the first time, those types of things, okay? So if you have an industry that has specific language, the courts will tend to use the language of that industry in order to interpret contracts. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take attendance and uh, probably let you guys go with just a couple of minutes early here. We could start chapter 17, little 17. A third person can contract. Let's worry about that next uh, next class. Give me four. I got you. You're here. I feel it's here. Steve is not here. Uh, Anthony is here. Fatty Spell is not here. Andrew Brandon. He's here. Devin Christian. 
Autumn. Uh, Damien is not here. Uh, Kathy Guerrero is here. Hashimoto. Oh, I'm sure Hashimoto is here. Braden Herbster. Braden. Abraham is here. Amy Jackson is here. Nick Janadlo here and wants to talk to me. Alec is here. Uh, Allison Kimball, I know where she is. Jonathan Koss is here. Alexander Martin is here. Bryce McCloskey is here. Chase Morrison is here. Asher Patton is here. Isaac Sasala is here. Austin Psycho is here. Mezekiah Tobias is here. Uh, Cade Wolf is here. Michaela Weiss is here. And Ian Yeager is here. All right. Thanks for coming.